Well, good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to our study of the Gospel of John. Welcome to Awake Us Now, and those of you who are joining us online, we're glad to have you with us as well. We're going to uh, continue with our study of the Gospel of John, picking up where we left off last week, but before we do, I'd just like to take some time for prayer. Let's come before the Lord, shall we? Heavenly Father, how we bless and praise your name. We, we honor you because you are so good, you are so incredibly gracious, you're so patient, and above all, you have such a powerful plan for our deliverance. We thank you for the way you reveal yourself in the scriptures. We praise you for the way you revealed your heart in our Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray that this evening, your Holy Spirit would open our eyes to see clearly, our hearts to receive everything you desire to impart, and our very souls to rejoice in the salvation that you have won for us and the life you give us. Lord, tonight, may we see, may we see you moving in power, not only in the past, but may we witness you moving in power in our lives today through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, what I'd like to do is pick up where we had left off last time, and if you will recall, we were in the Gospel of John chapter 18, uh, taking a look at Jesus and his disciples as Jesus has completed his teaching and his prayer for his disciples and for us, and now they head through the Kidron Valley and up onto the Mount of Olives, and it's there that we begin, and what I would like to do right now is, is kind of review something we began to, to look at last week. Uh, uh, but where we had to cut off. And so if you would turn in your Bibles to uh, John chapter 18, I, I'd like to begin at verse one. And it simply says, when he had finished praying, Jesus left with his disciples and crossed the Kidron Valley. On the other side, there was a garden and he and his disciples went into it. Now Judas, who betrayed him, knew the place because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas came to the garden, guiding a detachment of soldiers and some officials from the chief priests and the Pharisees. They were carrying torches, lanterns, and weapons. Last week, you will recall, we had ended with this verse, verse 3, and, and we had talked about this detachment of soldiers. The, the word that, that, Luke, that Luke, that John uses, another, uh, another gospel author, but different place, different time, and so forth. Anyway, the word that John uses is the Greek word spera, and it's the, the traditional word for a Roman cohort. Uh, a cohort was a, a substantial body of soldiers. We had discussed last time, depending on whether it was an auxiliary cohort or a part of the standing army, ranged in numbers anywhere from about 480 to 1,000, usually in, in the range of uh, 500 to 600. The person in charge of a cohort was a, called a kiliarch or a tribune, and uh, it is very obvious that a, a, a sizable body of soldiers come to uh, meet Jesus and his disciples. And, and if you think about that, I believe there's a lot here for us to unpack. Keep in mind, uh, on other occasions, Jesus deals with the Pharisees, the Sadducees, members of the Sanhedrin, and the temple guard. But this time, when the time for his final arrest and trial comes, the uh, high priests bring in Roman soldiers as well. And you can look at that and say, well, they just wanted to, you know, kind of double down and make sure they had all their bases covered. But I think there's more here. Uh, keep in mind, the normal procedure would be to use temple guards. But what has happened so far when temple guards are sent to arrest Jesus in the Gospel of John? The answer is they come back empty-handed. Remember the last time we saw that? The, the, the uh, high council sends their own guards, their own people, to go arrest Jesus. And then the guards come back, and, and they don't have anyone in chains. And when they're asked about it, they say, no one ever spoke like this man speaks, you know. And, and I, I believe there's, a, there's some, some revelation going on here. And what's happening is the, the high priests are saying, we can't even trust our own people. We've got to send someone in who, uh, frankly, is not going to be deceived by this, this upstart from Galilee. And as a result, they bring in the Romans, and no small number. As we saw last week, Spera, a cohort, 
uh, hundreds of individuals. Now, it may be that the entire, entire cohort did not come, but a sizable number of people came. And you can almost picture this in your mind. We're told by John that they were carrying torches, lanterns, and weapons. And uh, Jesus and his disciples have left Jerusalem, gone through the Kidron Valley, and now come to the Garden of Gethsemane. And again, another photograph taken just a few years ago of the traditional site of, of Gethsemane, uh, located up on the Mount of Olives, uh, directly across from the ancient city of Jerusalem. This map may help uh, put things in, in perspective a little bit better. Uh, this, uh, admittedly, this is not drawn to perfect scale and, and you know, it doesn't have all the roads and, and highways marked or anything like that, but it does give us an idea of the layout of the city of Jerusalem and the Mount of Olives at the time of Jesus. <laughs> First of all, I'm going to start on the right-hand side of the screen, the, the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives is a good size, good size hill, to put it mildly. It stretches about two miles in length from north to south. And uh, on the, uh, the western slope facing the city of Jerusalem, you go up to the peak and then down, and you go from Jerusalem about almost two miles to the city of Bethany, which is also on, on the Mount of Olives as well. And this is a, a, a large chunk of, of real estate in, in Israel. In Jesus' day, it looked a whole lot different than it does today. It is called the Mount of Olives because in Jesus' day, it was covered with olive trees. Those olive trees, many of them have come back and are being replanted, but uh, when the Romans destroyed the city of Jerusalem in the year 70 AD, they cut down all those trees. They, they used them as part of the, uh, the wall that was built surrounding the entire city of Jerusalem so that no one could get out. Uh, the picture that we saw just a moment ago of the Garden of Gethsemane, those trees wouldn't have been trees most likely that were standing in Jesus' day. Although, as I mentioned last week, they may well have grown up from the roots of those trees that had been cut down by the Romans. But Jesus and his disciples head from the city of Jerusalem through the Kidron Valley there in the center and then up the Mount of Olives to the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, what we have on this map is at least a, a help in trying to visualize all that has taken place. There are some places we know with great certainty. We know where Jerusalem was. We know where the Mount of Olives was. And we have some degree of evidence suggesting where some of these other places were. Some of that evidence greater in certain places than in others. What I'd like to do real quickly is trace what has happened over the, the last couple of hours as Jesus and his disciples leave the upper room and uh, head toward the, the Mount of Olives and then go into the Garden of Gethsemane. And uh, we'll just uh, mark this here in uh, red. Uh, for those of you who are watching online, I will try to make these lines really, really dark. I, I wish, I have to figure out, I don't know that there is a way to make a darker line, but we'll just keep going over it and hopefully it'll show up for you folks as well. Jesus and his disciples met in the upper room to celebrate the Lord's Supper, and it's there that Jesus tells the disciples, one of you will betray me. Uh, he tells the Peter that before cock crow, before the early morning hours, you're going to deny me three times. Uh, everyone is broken up over that. And Jesus also speaks one of his last words to his disciples, reminding them of things that are most important, reminding them of the importance of trusting him, following the Father's will, being faithful in prayer, loving one another as he has first loved us. And then they leave the upper room, and as they go along, Jesus talks about himself as the vine and us as the branches. They go either through the city of Jerusalem or south of it and uh, head in this direction through the Kidron Valley and finally up to the, the Garden of Gethsemane. Gethsemane itself, we think on the basis of some uh, circumstantial evidence to have been a walled garden. Uh, not just a, uh, you know, a, an open area, but a walled garden. There are some circumstantial evidences to suggest it was a garden owned by none other than Mary, the mother of John Mark, the author of the Gospel of Mark, and uh, that this is a place where Jesus met with his disciples, uh, even as we're told in, in the Gospel of John, on a regular basis. You know, it says that Jesus and the disciples came to Jerusalem and that they were in the temple during the day, but that at night, he went to the Mount of Olives. Now, 
On some occasions, he may well have gone to the house of Mary and Martha and Lazarus. But there's a very real possibility this is a place he not only went for prayer, but it's where the disciples camped out. And at a time when the, the religious leaders were looking for an opportunity to hunt him down, this would have been a, a natural place to hide out, especially if it were a walled garden, uh, a place where they could uh, basically talk, eat, and sleep in relative obscurity and uh, you know, out of the, the prying eyes. It is one of the reasons why it was so essential for the religious leaders to have a traitor, someone who could lead them to a place where Jesus was. And uh, we're told here in John 18, that's exactly what Judas did. So if you can picture Jesus and the disciples in this, this garden uh, where there was an olive press, because that's what Gethsemane means. And uh, it, is, it is night but it's also bright. I would remind you that when the living God established the feasts of the Lord for the children of Israel, he specified when those feasts were to take place, Passover, Pentecost, or Shavuot, and uh, Tabernacles. Uh, those three festivals were held when? During the full moon. And, and as a result, you could see. I mean, it's really a blessing from God to, to say, here's when you gather. That way, when people are camping out or going to a, a city where they don't normally spend time, uh, there's natural light. I, I can remember as a kid camping, and uh, you know, at nighttime, it gets incredibly dark. At least back in my day, they really didn't have any lights in the campgrounds. And so you had to depend on your flashlights, on a lantern, on the campfire, and so on. But when there was a full moon, I mean, if I may put it bluntly, you could easily see the outhouse. <laughs> that, uh, and uh, this is taking place at Passover during the time of the full moon. Jesus is with the disciples. We know from the, the other gospel authors that he was in prayer. And it's at that point, all of a sudden, this massive detachment of soldiers, priests, religious officials, and temple guards show up. And as John describes it, he describes it in a way that is unique in all of the Gospels. He gives us detail that we do not find anywhere else. Here is what he tells us. Verse 4, Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, oh, yeah, knowing all that was going to happen to him, went out and asked them, who is it you want? Please note, note who is in charge. We're going to see that through the rest of this gospel and through the rest of the Passion account. Contrary to what many people think, you know, there are many people who would say, well, the, the soldiers are in charge, uh, Pilate is in charge, the high priests are in charge, the arresting authorities are in charge. Jesus is in charge, and he's always been in charge. And by the way, there is a take home for us in our own lives. This is not just a theological point that we remember when we talk of our Lord's suffering and death and resurrection. It's for us today. He's in charge. He is the Lord. We are the disciples. We are to follow him, serve him. And life goes a whole lot smoother when we do what he tells us to do and we go where he leads us. So Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, goes out and asks and says, who is it you want? Now, he has known this all along. He knew well ahead of time and had told his disciples well ahead of time what was going to take place. When we read Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we see that on three separate occasions, Jesus tells his disciples, here's what's going to take place. We're going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to be handed over to wicked men they're going to arrest me, beat me, and I will be crucified and die. And on the third day, I will rise again. I and mean, he's told him this. And, and we are also told that the disciples didn't understand what he was talking about when he said rising from the dead. But now he, he has come to the, the critical moment. He knows what lies ahead, and he is in charge. And so he says, who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. I am he, Jesus said, or literally translated, I am. Ego e me. I am. This is the name of God. I am, Jesus said. And Judas the traitor was standing there with them. When Jesus said, I am, he, <laughs> I, 
I, I know we put it in the English translation, but it's not there in the original. He's saying, I am. Ego in me, I am. They drew back and fell to the ground. I, I love that. Uh, you know, it is obvious that he is in control here. And he is making it quite clear. This is not something that's happening by accident. This is not something that, you know, just sort of came about and Jesus was blindsided by it. This is the reason he came and this is the purpose for which he has come to carry out his work. And so he says this and they draw back and they fall to the ground. One of the questions I've always asked myself is which way do they fall? Did they fall backwards? Or did they fall forwards? Now, I can't prove anything from here in scripture. I do know this. When God shows up and people encounter the living God, they fall on their faces. Remember when uh, Abraham saw the three strangers come. We later learn it was God himself in the flesh and, and two angels taking on, taking on human form. And what does Abraham do? He falls to the ground. What happens when Moses encounters the living God at Mount Horeb or Mount Sinai? Take off your sandals. The ground on which you're standing is holy ground. When Moses in Exodus 34 encounters the living God, he falls on his face. Uh, that is the, the normal pattern throughout the Hebrew scriptures. And now Jesus uses the name of God in answer to the question, who are you looking for? And, and they say, Jesus of Nazareth, he says, I am, and they fall before him. They can't help themselves. It just happens. Again, he asks them, who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they said. Jesus answered, I told you that I am. <laughs> if you're looking for me, then let these men go. This happened so that the words he had spoken would be fulfilled. I have not lost one of those you gave me. You will recall, we read those words earlier as Jesus prayed to the Father in John 17 as part of his high priestly prayer. He says, I haven't lost any of those you gave me. I protected them. And now he is still protecting them. Uh, do you think that may have application for today? He protects his own. Doesn't mean we don't go through difficult days. It doesn't mean that we won't face critical times. It doesn't mean, in fact, Jesus makes it very clear, some of us are going to die for our faith. But it does mean he's going to protect us. And he's going to see us through to the end. And therefore, we do not have to be afraid. And right now, he is protecting his disciples. He says, I am. Let these guys go. And John tells us that was to fulfill the word he had spoken just minutes or hours earlier. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Jesus commanded Peter, put your sword away. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? Now you could see how easily this thing could have gotten out of hand. Jesus has just said, I am. They have fallen down. He asks him a second time, who are you looking for? He says, I am. Let these guys go. And in the midst of all of that, picture this in your mind's eye, a bright full moon, Jesus and the disciples in a garden filled with olive trees, this crowd of soldiers, perhaps numbering in the hundreds, along with priests and religious officials and temple guards, carrying torches and lanterns, and all of a sudden, Peter steps out and, and he takes the sword and he whips off the ear of an individual whose name is only given here in the Gospel of John, Malchus. Um, I ask you the question, when Peter took a swipe at Malchus, what do you think he was trying to do? You think he was trying to cut off an ear? I think he was trying to cut off his head. He, he, he's dealing a, a blow to the head. He, he wants to take this guy out. And uh, Jesus says, stop it. Stop it right now. And shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? You think of all the times Jesus has rebuked Peter here in, in this uh, short window of time, but also throughout his ministry. I, I mean, Peter, you, you got to love the guy because he is impulsive. 
He is an action kind of guy. If they made Bible action figures, you know, Peter would be one who would have a hand moving all of the time and would be taking a step out of the boat to, to walk on the water and so on. But uh, Peter is very, very active. He's quick to move, and Jesus shuts it down right there. A reminder, Jesus is in charge. And another reminder, in a very short window of time, Peter is going to go from the one disciple who tried to fight off an army to the guy who will cringe before a servant girl and a group of people around a fire. And uh, I find great comfort in that. And here's why. Peter would go on to become one of the most effective, effective ministers of the message of Jesus. Uh, a, a powerful evangelist, a man whom God would use in a mighty way. And yet he was a flawed character. Every one of these people were fra flawed characters. You know, everyone was a flawed individual. And the Lord still used him. And he transforms them through his resurrection, even as he transforms you and me. And as we look at this story, it is a reminder that the Lord Jesus is at the heart of everything. And he is in control. And in him, you and I can rise above any difficulty, any trial, any, any, uh, you know, any attack, and be used by him in a mighty way. So Jesus shuts it down, tells him, put your sword away. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? Verse 12. Excuse me there. There we go. Then the detachment of soldiers with its commander, and the word used for commander is the, uh, the Greek word kiliarch. It means a tribune, an individual who is in charge of an entire cohort. Then the detachment of soldiers with its commander and the Jewish officials arrested Jesus. They bound him and brought him first to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. May I point to one word here in particular? That's it, bound, they bound him. Something I don't recall ever noticing until yesterday. <laughs> Now, maybe I've seen it before and just forgotten it, which is not beyond the realm of the possible, you know. <laughs> but uh, what, what struck me yesterday, I went back and took a look at Matthew, Mark, and Luke and their accounts of Jesus' arrest. Do you know that John is the only one who mentions that Jesus was bound? The others say he was arrested, they took him to the, the trial and so forth, but only John says he was bound. Now, thinking about what we know of the Gospel of John, something that should have been obvious for centuries, but is only becoming a, 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 something that people are aware of in very, very recent times. The Gospel of John is the most Jewish Gospel of them all. And when you think of someone being bound, allowing himself to be bound as he is being taken to what appears to be his death, does anything come to mind from the Hebrew scriptures? Genesis 22, Abraham and Isaac. Abraham is told by God to take your son, your only son whom you love, take him to Mount Moriah and offer him up as a sacrificial offering. And what does Abraham do for three days? He goes on the journey, taking Isaac with him. They get to Mount Moriah. He has Isaac carry the wood on his shoulders up to the point where they are going to offer up the sacrifice. And then Abraham, who is, in, is well over 100 years old, binds the wrists of his son Isaac. And Isaac, if we understand correctly, he was no little boy. He's probably at least in his teens. The rabbi said he was 37. <laughs> but he allows himself to be bound and placed on the altar. Jesus is in control, but he allows himself to be bound. Shall I not drink the cup, cup the Father has given me to drink? He is willing to go all the way. And John gives us that, that powerful little detail that is just so, uh, so filled with meaning in light of the Hebrew scriptures. So, 
Verse uh, 12, continuing, they bind him and brought him first to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas. This also is a detail only mentioned in the Gospel of John. Uh, John alone tells us that Jesus is first brought to Annas for the trial. Annas was not the high priest at that time, but he was looked upon by the Jewish people, at least by the hierarchy, as being the rightful high priest. Keep in mind, a high priest was to remain in that office until he died, according to the Torah. But the Romans had deposed Annas from the high priesthood. Uh, we even know from, from records that have survived when that happened. Uh, Annas was high priest, we believe, from about the year 6 AD to the year 15 AD. At that time, the, the Roman uh, procurator, Gratus, deposed Annas and put another in his place. But Annas, at that time, was only 37 years old or so, 36. And uh, because of that, we can do the math. And you kind of get an idea of how old this guy is at the time of Jesus. Uh, there are two main dates that are usually proposed for the arrest, crucifixion, and resurrection of Jesus. They're the years 30 and 33 AD. Taking that into account, Annas, at this point, is somewhere in his early to mid-50s when Jesus is brought before him. And we are told then that he is the father-in-law of Caiaphas. And by the way, we've seen this picture before, but I would just remind you, a discovery made a matter of years ago, a, an ossuary, a bone box, beautifully decorated, discovered in a, a cave that was uh, exposed as a result of some, uh, some construction work. On the side of this is written the name of the occupant, Joseph Caiaphas. This is, most people believe, the burial site of the man who was the, the son-in-law of Annas, the high priest, and who had himself become high priest. We don't know what Caiaphas' age was, but assuming that he was married at about the time most Jewish men and young women got married, Caiaphas would not, most likely have been in his 30s. But uh, Annas is the one before whom Jesus appears. And so if I can go back to this map once more, let's trace the route and what would have taken place. What we are told is Jesus is led from Gethsemane up here on the Mount of Olives and is taken to the, uh, the compound of the high priest. Archaeologists in re recent years have uncovered in the ancient city of Jerusalem at, of Jesus' day the remains of a massive priestly compound. It, it bears all the, the marks of being a huge mansion, a palatial mansion owned by a high priest. It may well have been the house of Annas and Caiaphas. And if that is indeed the case, in all likelihood, what you have is this massive home with a huge courtyard and then living quarters surrounding it. Uh, Annas and Caiaphas may have lived on, on opposite sides of the, the, uh, the courtyard, for that matter. Uh, we also know that uh, Annas had five sons and a son-in-law who became high priest. He, he really was the power behind the throne. And so he is the one to whom Jesus is first taken. And so Jesus would have been led through the Kidron Valley and over to the compound of the high priest. Uh, again, this is a guesstimate, but it gives us an idea, a way of picturing this. And this then is what John describes as all of this is taking place. It says... Uh, Caiaphas, verse 14, Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jewish leaders that it would be good if one man died for the people. You'll recall that took place after Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead. Many people came to faith in Jesus as a result of that incredible miracle. But many others went and told the religious authorities what had happened, and they went into a tizzy. And, and the questions that were being raised is, how do we deal with this? What's going to happen next? And finally, Caiaphas gets up and says, you guys just don't understand, do you? You don't understand that it's necessary that one man die rather than that the entire, entire people perish. And then John gives us this note. He was high priest that year, and he didn't say it in his own, own strength or in his own, out of his own mind. Being high priest that year, he was actually prophesying what Jesus would do. And John reminds us of that once more. So Jesus is taken now before Annas, 
the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest. And we read then in verse 15, Simon Peter and another disciple were following Jesus. Because this disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the high priest's courtyard, but Peter had to wait outside the door. The other disciple who was known to the high priest came back, spoke to the servant girl on duty there, and brought Peter in. The, the picture that John is painting here is of John and Peter following Jesus, whether they followed Jesus together or went separately, you know, you can argue both ways. But they get to the, the gate to the compound of Annas, the high priest. And John, we are told, is known by the high priest. And so the question has often been raised, how was John someone who was known to Annas, the high priest? What, what, what brought that about? Many have suggested on the basis of some circumstantial evidence that John and the entire family of Zebedee being fishermen up in Galilee, provide, provided fish for the high priestly home. And uh, that perhaps that's the way they were known, you know, bringing down salted fish from up north to the high priest. Possibility. There's another possibility, however, that is written by one of the, the first Christian historians whose work has actually survived. His name is Eusebius. He lived in the fourth century, the 300s. And Eusebius quotes another early Christian author, another early Christian historian, actually, who lived in the late 100s. And he gives us this detail about John. And uh, I'd like to share that with you. This is from Eusebius's History of the Church. And uh, this is what Eusebius writes. Uh, he says the following, when and how Paul and Peter died and where after their departure from this life, their mortal remains were laid, I've already explained. The date of John's death has also been roughly fixed. The place where his mortal remains lie can be gathered from a letter of Polycrates, Bishop of Ephesus to Victor, Bishop of Rome. In it, he refers to John, and then he quotes from this early author. He says, there is John, who leaned back on the Lord's chest and who became a sacrificing priest wearing the mitre, a martyr, and a teacher. He too sleeps in Ephesus. Now, if Eusebius is correct in quoting this early Christian historian. It would mean that John was probably known to the high priest because John was a priest himself. Now, in the 21st century, we look at that and we say, well, wait a minute, you know, uh, if he was a priest, how could he have been a fisherman and how could he have been following Jesus around? Keep in mind, the priests were descendants of the tribe of Levi. And if this author is correct, this ancient witness, then John would have been a member of the Levitical priesthood and uh, would have known the high priest apparently because of his service in the city of Jerusalem at the temple. Now, you would say to yourself, well, how, how could that be? Keep in mind, the priests in Israel only went on service at the temple twice a year and that for a week at a time. So that left 50 extra weeks to do other stuff. Do you think they spent their time in their, their office writing sermons? No, they had other jobs. They had other, other careers. They, they, they had other trades. John, the son of Zebedee, was a fisherman. But if this ancient witness is correct, he was also a priest. And, and that may help us understand why he was known to the high priest. But anyway, as John goes on to describe what happens, he says the following. John, who was known to the other disciple, John, who was known to the high priest, came back, spoke to the servant girl on duty, and brought Peter in. So Peter is standing outside the gate in the light of the full moon, and, and he's waiting for something to happen. When John comes back, the door opens, and John talks to the servant girl who's taken care of the gate, and he says, could you let this guy in? And she says, okay. And then as Peter walks through the door, <laughs> verse 17, you aren't one of this man's disciples too, are you? She asked Peter. He replied, I'm not. And that's the first denial. It's a denial in the face 
of a little servant girl who sees him in the light of the moon and says, wait a minute, are you one of those disciples of Jesus? Peter says, no, not me, not me, I'm not. Yeah. And so they go into the courtyard. Verse 18, it was cold and the servants and officials stood around a fire they had made to keep warm. Peter also was standing with them, warming himself. This is one of those instances where we see once again, clear eyewitness testimony. You know, when major events take place, people often remember where they were when those events happened. You ask someone who is at least in their 20s today, where, or at least mid to late 20s, where were you on 9-11? And, and they can tell you. You ask someone who is in their 80s or 90s, where were you when Pearl Harbor was bombed? And they can tell you. You ask someone who's in their 60s, where were you when President Kennedy was assassinated? And they can tell you. You remember those things. And, and oftentimes you remember strange details. I, I remember where I was when I learned that President Kennedy wa was assassinated. I was in Miss Kerlitis' fifth grade class. And, and you know, I, I, I can vividly recall it. I remember the principal coming into the, to the classroom, whispering to my teacher, Miss Kerlitis, and her suddenly sobbing and running out of the room. And one of the kids in the front, as the principal went out to try to comfort her, one of the kids in the front whispered back what had happened. And, and this is what we were told. I think the, the president of the school board died. <laughs> you, know? you remember those things. I, I remember my dad telling me where he was when Pearl Harbor was bombed. It was a Sunday. They had come home from church. They were getting ready for dinner, and he and his brother were playing with their electric trains underneath the dining room table. You remember those details. Here's one of the details. Peter's warming himself by the fire. It's spring in Israel. Still gets cool at night, and Peter is standing there trying to keep warm, but also trying to perhaps move back into the shadows so that people don't really notice him. John tells us this. Verse 19. Meanwhile, the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. Isn't that an interesting combination? He questioned him about his disciples and his teaching. Why do you think he was asking him questions about his disciples? I, I believe one of the reasons is the high priest and those around him were concerned about how far this is spread. Uh, keep in mind, they've already seen their own soldiers, temple guards coming back empty-handed and saying, no one has ever taught like this man. Uh, they, they have seen this Jesus penetrating the entire city of Jerusalem and the surrounding areas. They've seen the huge crowds welcoming him on the day we call Palm Sunday. They're afraid there are traitors in the midst. They want to know who's following you and how do we locate them. They, they want to know, they basically want to know who's on your side as well as his teaching. And Jesus responds, verse 20, I've spoken openly to the world, Jesus replied. I always taught in synagogues or at the temple where all the Jews come together. I said nothing in secret. Why question me? Ask those who heard me. Surely they know what I said. <laughs> Among those they could ask, <laughs> the temple guards who had been listening and said, no one has ever spoken like this man speaks. And Annas is furious, and so are the people watching him. Verse 22, when Jesus said this, one of the officials nearby slapped him in the face. Is this the way you answer the high priest, he demanded? If I said something wrong, Jesus replied, testify as to what is wrong. But if I spoke the truth, why did you strike me? Does it strike you once again that Jesus is in control? I mean, he's the one on trial. And yet he is the one who's questioning the judge. <laughs> and now when he is slapped down, he questions the official who has just slapped him. If I've, if I've said something wrong, you tell me. But if I've spoken the truth, why did you do this? You're breaking, you're breaking the law. <laughs> Verse 24, then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Don't you wonder what all took place that night? And isn't it rather interesting that 
At this point, Jesus goes to Caiaphas, something that is mentioned by the other gospel authors, but nothing is said here about the encounter with Caiaphas. Just simply, Jesus is taken to him, and then the narrative continues, verse 25. Meanwhile, Simon Peter was still standing there warming himself. So they asked him, you aren't one of his disciples too, are you? He denied it saying, I am not. Again, picture this. Peter's in the courtyard. The fire is burning. He's trying to keep, probably trying to keep his head down, making sure he's not noticed. Maybe he has pulled up his prayer shawl over his head. But the people standing there with him look at him and say, hey, you're not one of the disciples, are you? No, no, not at all. And at that point, things really get hot. We read this. One of the high priest's servants, verse 26, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, challenged him. Didn't I see you with him in the garden? And boy, now things are really bad. Because somebody who is a relative of Malchus, who saw what took place, looks at Peter and says, you look familiar to me. You're the guy who had the sword. <laughs> you know, that, that's what this is saying. And you have to wonder, what else went on here? Now, John does not give us this detail. The other gospel authors do. Jesus picked up the ear after Peter had sliced it off and he put it back and he healed him. Pastor Phil mentioned something really fascinating in class this morning. And and what he mentioned is this, that years ago he nicked his ear and he said it took forever to heal because the ear, the outer areas are made up primarily of cartilage and cartilage is the slowest thing to heal. Now, think about that. Uh, Pastor Phil, do you recall how long it took you to, to heal? Do you months and months and months. Months and months and months, There's yeah. There's no blood supply to cartilage. That's yeah. why it takes a long time. No blood supply to cartilage. It takes a long time. And Jesus simply picks up that ear, puts it back, and it's healed. Uh, that's something you'd remember, too. And you'd also remember... The, the scuffle that took place. And so now Peter is exposed by an individual who is a relative of the guy whose ear he had just cut off, maybe hours earlier. And it's at this point, Peter loses it. You aren't one of his disciples, are you? I'm not. Then verse 26 One of the high priest's servants, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, challenged him. Didn't I see with him in the garden? Again, Peter denied it. And at that moment, a rooster began to crow. That's the way my translation has it. Literally translated, at that moment, rooster crow. Most likely, the sounding of the trumpet in the early morning hours. And Peter suddenly remembers what he has done and what Jesus had said. And now John continues the narrative, verse 29. Then the Jewish leaders, then the Jewish leaders took Jesus from Caiaphas to the palace of the Roman governor. By now it was early morning and to avoid ceremonial uncleanness, they did not enter the palace because they wanted to be able to eat the Passover. I find that just incredibly ironic. Here are individuals who are taking an innocent man and uh, they're, they're basically railroading him to execution. But they want to make sure that they keep their hands clean so they can celebrate the Passover. You know? And uh, they bring him to the Roman governor. Uh, literally, they, they bring him to the praetorium, the, the place where the governor stays. And the question that has been raised over the centuries is, where was that? Uh, There are many places that have been suggested, and uh, I'd like to just kind of highlight some of them. Several places that have been suggested for the the, the place where Jesus would have been taken to uh, stand before Pilate. One of those places is Fortress Antonia, the, the red square there. 
And uh, what we know from the, the writings of the Jewish historian Josephus, uh, Fortress Antonia was located north of the temple. It was the place where the Roman garrison was housed. Josephus describes it as a very large compound. In fact, he says it was the size of a couple of cities. The difficulty we have today is finding it. Uh, the traditional site is north of what is called Temple Mount, but there is actually no evidence for a Roman fortress ever being there. Uh, the usual explanation is it was totally dissembled. That is one of the reasons that some people in recent years have suggested that perhaps Fortress Antonia was not north of Temple Mount, but was actually the site that is today called Temple Mount. Because Temple Mount, contrary to what Josephus tells us about the size of the mount, Josephus describes it basically as a square, 600 feet by 600 feet. Uh, Temple Mount is about 22, 23 acres. And, and it is the size of a Roman fortress. There are many of these found throughout Europe and the Mediterranean. Massive forts built by the Romans of, of you know, gigantic size. Uh, that's one of the reasons some people have said maybe we're looking at the wrong spot both for the temple and for Fortress Antonia. Uh, another possibility is that the, uh, the place, the Praetorium where Pilate was, is the purple rectangle at the far left-hand side of the screen, the western side of the ancient city of Jerusalem. This was an area known as Herod's Palace. And there are many who believe it was perhaps here that Jesus was tried, and it would have been here that Pilate would have stayed. It would have been a very comfortable place. Uh, you know, the, the, equip, the accommodations of, of one of the finest of hotels, but surrounded by mighty walls. This has been excavated over the years, and this is a, a photograph of the remains of part of Herod's palace that lies on the, the western edge of the ancient walled city of Jerusalem. Uh, you know, you, you can't get much of an idea from this, but at least you can see it was a pretty impressive place. Uh, also, we, we know from models that have been produced, you know, that the, the place where Jesus met with uh, Pilate was either up here, the uh, Fortress Antonia on this model, or over here, the Palace of Herod, or as, as I mentioned and some have suggested, the temple itself was located further south of the existing Temple Mount, and Temple Mount was actually the, the Roman camp. Wherever Jesus was taken, he's now brought before Pilate, and uh, this is what we're told. He comes to Pilate. This, by the way, that I've shown you up on the screen the, is the remains of part of the defensive structure of Jerusalem, part of the wall that in encompassed Herod's palace. It is the only part of the wall that is still standing from Jesus' day. Uh, we are told that the Romans destroyed everything, took them down to the foundations, but left these, this tower standing so that people would know just how powerful the, the fortifications were when they conquered the city. Uh, today, you can see that it's located near the Jaffa Gate and uh, when you look at those stones, you are looking at something that has been standing for over 2,000 years. There is a very real possibility that is within this area that Jesus was taken before Pilate. But here is what John tells us, the rest of the story. Verse 29, so Pilate came out to them and asked, what charges are you bringing against this man? Now that's the way a Roman high official would begin court proceedings. This is the equivalent of hear ye, hear ye, the court of Pontius Pilate is in session. What charges are you bringing against this man? If he were not a criminal, they replied, we would not have handed him over to you. You can really sense the tension between these two sides, can't you? Pilate has allowed his guards to arrest Jesus. In part, I would guess because he wanted to keep peace during Passover. Passover was an incredibly uh, dangerous time for the Romans because Jewish national interests and, and uh, uh, concerns were at peak. Uh, keep in mind, Passover was kind of the equivalent of the 4th of July, uh, Easter Sunday, Christmas, and uh, uh, you know, Flag Day all rolled up into one for the Jewish people. And so, 
you could see Pilate saying, okay, I'll send my guards to arrest this guy so we don't have trouble in the city. But now when they bring him to Pilate and they're making charges, Pilate wants to show who's in control. And he says, what charges are you bringing? And they respond, they want to show they're in control. They respond, if this guy weren't guilty, we wouldn't have brought him to you. And so Pilate says, verse 31, take him yourselves and judge by your own law. But we have no right to execute anyone, they objected. This took place to fulfill what Jesus had said about the kind of death he was going to die. Keep in mind, the Jewish method of execution, capital punishment, was death by stoning. But we are told from writings that have survived that somewhere in the early part of the first century, the Romans took away from the high priests and from the Sanhedrin the right to convict in capital cases. And they demanded that they be the ones to carry it out. And that's why Jesus was crucified, not stoned. So verse 20 or 33, Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus and asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Is that your own idea, Jesus asked? Or did others talk to you about me? <laughs> I love that. Pilate thinks he's in charge. The high priests think they're in charge, but Jesus makes it clear he's in charge. And rather than simply answering the question of the man who holds his life in his hand, he asks a question of the judge. Jesus is putting Pilate on trial. He's saying, in effect, uh, did, did you come up with this on your own or did someone else tell you? And Pilate's answer is, verse 35, am I a Jew? Pilate replied, your own people and chief priests handed you over to me. What is it you have done? Then verse 36, Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. I call your attention to one little word. In Greek, it's the word nun. In English, it's the word now. My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my followers would have fought. But now my kingdom is from another place. I believe it's very important for us to let now soak into our hearts and lives. Because you see, we're living in a world today where many people, including many, many church people, say, when we die, we go to heaven, our spirits are with God forever, and yada, 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 that's the end. That is not what the Bible teaches. That, that is not biblical theology. Your destiny and mine, our destiny is not to be a disembodied spirit. We're going to be raised. And the scripture actually says, Revelation chapter 5, we will reign on the earth. Just as Jesus was raised from the grave, we are going to be raised from the grave. Jesus is not saying, my kingdom is not of this world, and my kingdom is when, you know, disembodied spirits get together and float around in the clouds, and we listen to harp music. And I like harp music as much as the next guy, which may not be saying a whole lot. But uh, that's not our destiny. Our destiny is to be raised, and to be raised at the last day. And Jesus is making that clear. He's saying, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my followers would fight. But now my kingdom is in another place. But the day is coming when he will return, when the dead will be raised, and when we will reign with him. That is our destiny, a new heaven and a new earth. It's what the Hebrew prophets said. It's what the New Testament teaches. You are a king then, verse 37, said Pilate. Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. What is truth? Retorted Pilate. What is truth? You know, for years, I have heard those, I've heard those words from the time I was a little boy, listening to the story of Jesus' trial and crucifixion. I have looked at those words through the eyes of a child, I've looked at those words through the eyes of a 20-year-old and as a 30-year-old. Now I'm looking at those words through the eyes of a 60-plus-year-old. What is truth? 
And I realized that today I'm living in a society where people are not only asking that question, what is truth? People are saying, well, you have your truth, I have my truth. Truth doesn't matter. But Jesus says, anyone who is of the truth listens to him because he is the way and the truth and the life. Pilate is a typical Roman, a, a practitioner of realpolitik. You know, you do what you have to do to keep in power and to make things work and keep from getting a bad report. And Jesus is saying, you need the truth because only the truth will set you free. That's what Jesus had said. You will know the truth and the truth will set you free. And anyone who is of the truth, Jesus says, listens to my voice. And Pilate says, ah, what is truth? But he's going to encounter the truth, the truth personified. And Pilate is going to be shaken, shaken to the core. And that's where we need to stop tonight. And we'll pick up there next week. But right now, I'd like to turn things over to my colleague and dear friend and buddy, Pastor Phil. Uh, well, maybe some of you have already heard this news, but uh, here it is for the first time if it's new to you. And that is that I have served here at Awakus now for five years, ever since we started, almost exactly five years ago. And I've served in all different kinds of ministries, and this one's so unique with its media ministry and its prayer ministry and its emphasis on proclaiming to America and to the world we need to repent. Especially if we're Christians, we need to repent first. How can we expect unbelievers to repent? We need to start the whole process, and then we can love them enough and care about them enough so that they'll repent. I've enjoyed assisting Pastor Dodge and others here in that ministry, but lo and behold, the years have gone by, have gone by and on Christmas Eve, my birthday, I will be 70 years old. And so perhaps you can guess what I'm going to say, that I've reached the point at which I realize that It'd be nice not to have to keep such a strict schedule all the time. And so uh, I, I will be retiring. But if you know anything about pastors, they never retire until they can't get out of the house. And instead, we're, we're always looking for a new way to serve, another way to proclaim the gospel. And I will be doing that in various ways, and perhaps you'll hear about it through Awake Us Now as time goes by. I'm not going to totally drop out of Awake. I'm still involved in, involved in it in some ways, uh, but it's going to be on a much smaller scale. And, but mainly, I wanted to tell you that I've appreciated working here, and I have appreciated the opportunity to serve you, to be with you folks, to encourage you in your witnessing, and in being God's people in these last days. There's a challenge before us to be faithful in our generation, and uh, this is one ministry among others that God is using to call the church to be faithful. Thank you for your kindness to me, and thank you especially for your faithfulness to the Lord Jesus in these days. Thanks. Thank you, Brother Phil. We have known one another for 26 years, something, something like, like that. that. Yeah. yeah, and uh, the first time we were reflecting this morning, the first time we met, Phil had spoken at a pastoral conference and had talked about outreach promises, how God desires to reach all people. And he is the one who is opening doors all around the world to lead people to the Lord Jesus. And I remember listening to Phil talk and saying, this guy gets it. And, and we, we got acquainted with one another at the end of, of your yeah, right conversation and, and yeah. had a great time talking. Yeah, and I realized this guy gets it. <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, we began meeting together with some like-minded brothers. Yeah. And, and then we started working together. And uh, God has just, he has knit us together yeah. in so many ways. Yeah. And uh, I love you, brother, and I wish you the best. And I look forward to continuing to work and pray with you in the years yeah. to come. And it sure will happen. God bless yeah. you, Phil. God bless you. So thanks a lot. 
we're going to uh, close with a word of prayer and uh, wrap things up here this evening, okay? Heavenly Father, first of all, we praise you for faithful servants. We praise you for our brother Phil, Pastor Phil, who has just had such a huge influence on so many of us and so many others. We, we thank you, Lord, for your word of truth that speaks in every generation and especially ours, calling people to repentance and to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the truth. May your word of truth, Lord, echo and reverberate throughout this land. May many people who are now living in darkness see the light of Christ. May those who have wandered return to him who is the way and the truth and the life. And may you be glorified until that glorious day when the Lord Jesus returns and we behold you face to face and reign with him on the earth, even as the scriptures declare. Amen.